I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Naming something doesn't mean that we Hi everybody, I'm Dan Wertheimer. I'm a, an astronomer at the University of California in Berkeley. And I want to talk to you about this question, are we alone? Is anybody out there seeking other civilizations? Uh, this is a question that people have been thinking about for a couple hundred thousand years. You might know about this guy, Frank Drake. He worked out something called the Drake Equation uh, in, in the early 60s. And the Drake Equation is a way to calculate the number of civilizations that we could communicate with in our galaxy. And on the left of that equation, uh, on the left of the equal sign is the number of civilizations we can talk to in our galaxy. And all you have to do is multiply all those factors together on the right side of the equation. Uh, and you can calculate. The problem with this equation is that we don't know what any of the factors are. The way it, that equation works, the Drake equation is it's, it's a whittling down process. You start with the number of stars in the galaxy and you say, well, how many of those stars have planets? And then how many of those planets are good planets with the right temperature and the right chemicals and liquid water? And they say, okay, if you have a good planet, how many of those good planets does life get started on? And if you get life, does it get intelligence? And if you get intelligent life, do they develop communication? And then the very last factor, L, on the very right side of the equation there, is how long do they live? Do they blow themselves up right away? Do they develop chemical and uh, atomic weapons? Uh, or do they figure out how to live together in peace? Our civilization is about 5 billion years old. Uh, the Earth is about 5 billion years old. Uh, the life on this planet has been around almost all that time. Um, but uh, the star, our sun is going to last another few billion years, so we could live a long time. Some stars are 10 billion years old, twice as old as our sun and our planet. So there could be very advanced civilizations out there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about these different factors of the Drake equation, and then I'll talk about how we are searching for life in the universe. Uh, so um, one of the factors was how many stars out there. So the Milky Way galaxy is made of about 300 billion stars, and there are 100 billion galaxies as well. So that's a big number, 100 billion galaxies, each with about 100 billion stars. That's 10 to the 22 stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, plenty of stars. You might remember the next factor is how many planets there are. This is something that we didn't know until about 25 years ago. We knew about the planets going around our own star, of course, but we didn't know if there were planets going around other stars. And that's because planets are really hard to find. They're little dinky things. A million Earths could fit inside the sun. Planets don't give off any light. And they are right next to these really bright things. They're right next to bright stars. So it's like looking for a firefly next to a searchlight or something. It's very hard. But 25 years ago, the first planets were found using this technique called the wobble technique, where uh, the planet, when the planet goes around the star, you can't actually see the planet directly with your telescope. But what you can detect is when the planet goes around the star, it, it tugs on the star. And so when the planet goes around like this, the, the star wiggles a little bit. And so when, it, when the planet's over here, the, the star moves a little bit this way. And when it's out in front of you, the star moves toward you. And you can detect that wiggling star and that betrays the presence of a planet. The way it was actually detected is when the star is moving toward you, the light gets a little bluer. And when the star is moving away from you, the light gets a little redder. It's called a Doppler shift. And that's how the first planets were formed. This is a plot of one of the early uh, solar systems that was discovered this way, and you can see the wiggle as a function of time over the over looks like 18 years, and you can actually see two wiggles. One's a very quick, uh, rapid wiggle, and one is kind of two wiggles in those 18 years. Uh, and the reason there are two kind of wiggles, a high frequency wiggle and the low frequency wiggle, is that there are actually two planets going around this star. One's going around, you know, once every 18 years or so, and one looks like it's going around every couple of years or so. Um, so there's another way that was um, just happened in the last few years to find planets, and that's the, called the occultation method. And it, it, what happens when a planet goes in front of a star, the light dims a little tiny bit. It doesn't dim very much because the planet is a little tiny thing. If you look at that star on the picture there, you see a little black dot in front of it. That's to a kind of an artist picture of what it would look like. We can't actually see the planet going in front of the star, but what we can detect is the starlight dimming down a little bit. 
it's hard to see this dimming from the ground because the atmosphere makes stars twinkle and they dim just because the atmosphere is jiggling around. But uh, if you go into space and you see, it's easier to detect this dimming. And Kepler was a mission, it was a camera that was launched by NASA and it looked at about 100,000 stars, just taking pictures constantly of 100,000 stars looking for this dimming. And it found that most stars have planets. And in fact, most stars have multiple planets going around. And a lot of the planets are in what we call the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone. If you, you don't wanna have a planet that's too hot, too close to its sun or too far away, um, but in that kind of green zone on this picture, uh, you can see that there are several planets in habitable zones. It looks like maybe 5% of the planets have, uh, are kind of nice planets that might habit life. That means they're not too hot, not too cold. They have liquid water, the right chemicals and the right temperature, little rocky planets. Uh, and um, that's a lot of planets because there are a trillion planets in the galaxy. That's more planets than there are stars. So there are a lot of planets and a lot of them are sort of perhaps habitable planets with the right conditions. Well, the next factor in the Drake equation is if you have a good planet, how often do you get life? And we really don't know, but people have done experiments kind of simulating the, the what we call the primordial soup, what was around at the, at the early experiment, uh, uh, at the early Earth. Um, this is a, one of the early experiments where you, we knew that certain chemicals are, were around when Earth was forming. And uh, they put those chemicals in this flask, uh, methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen. And they also put sparks in there in that flask because we knew there was lightning around in the early days. And you don't get gorillas crawling out of this thing, but you do get the basic building blocks of life, the amino acids that you and I are made of. So we're beginning to see how you take simple molecules, which are abundant in the universe, and you can make more complicated uh, molecules and build your way up to protein and perhaps eventually self-replicating molecules like RNA and DNA. Although we don't have a complete picture of how that happened. We are optimistic that it happens in a lot of places um, because it happened quickly on Earth, even though we understand the details of how we got to self-replicating molecules, because as soon as the Earth cooled down, life popped up, the oldest rocks you can find have fossils on them. Because it happened quickly, we think it's probably a common process. And we think it's likely that there, there's primitive life in a lot of different places. There may even be primitive life in our own backyard, in, in our own solar system. Um, Jupiter has a moon called Europa. Jupiter has a lot of moons, but this one's really cool. Um, Europa has a liquid ocean, that blue, this is a cutaway view, that blue stuff is uh, ocean completely covering the planet. Unfortunately, the liquid ocean is covered by ice, the white stuff in the picture is uh, uh, an ice covering that's about 30 miles thick. And we'd like to see if there's something swimming down there. NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency, are thinking about how we can get through that ice and see if there's something swimming down there. I gave a talk a couple years ago at a middle school and a 12 year old girl said, could you get through the ice using a small submarine, maybe this big, and make the hull of the submarine out of a, a radioactive material with a short half-life. Uh, and that short half-life radioactive material would get the hull of the submarine hot uh, so it could melt its way through the ice. And by the way, could you take advantage of the difference in temperature between the radioactive hull and the cold ice and cover it with thermopiles, which generate electricity when there's a difference in temperature? I thought that was pretty clever and I told my colleagues at NASA. So anyway, NASA's thinking about how to get through there and see if there's something swimming. So it turns out there's another moon that you, where you don't have to get through the ice. It's got a, a, a similar situation, Enceladus. The moon is called Enceladus. It's going around Saturn, and it's got uh, a, an ocean, a global ocean covered by ice. But what's interesting about Enceladus that is it's got these cracks in the ice. Down at the bottom of the picture, you can see there are fissures in the ice, and there's some of the liquid ocean is squirting out and it forms these plumes. And NASA and ESA are thinking about missions where we could fly through the plume and sample the liquid ocean and find out if there are bacteria or single-celled creatures in there. Okay, I wanna talk about SETI, which is looking for intelligent life. SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And um, people have had all kinds of ideas for how we might get in touch with 
advanced civilizations, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, one of the ideas 200 years ago, Carl Gauss, the mathematician, suggested that we make large geometric structures on Earth. And um, in the middle there, he suggested a right triangle made out of pine trees, maybe three, four, or five miles on a side, and then big squares of dirt and wheat and water. And E.T. would uh, look down at this structure and figure out that we knew about the Pythagorean theorem and maybe they would get in touch. Um, uh, unfortunately, it was not funded. But then a new idea, von Littron suggested that we get in touch with E.T. by digging a circular ditch 20 miles across and fill that ditch with kerosene and use the match down at the bottom right of the picture, uh, that's not to scale by the way, to light that kerosene and make a big circular fire. And E.T. would look down with their big telescopes and see this bright circle of light and perhaps they would get in touch. Unfortunately, that project met with a similar fate. Charles Crow, also a couple hundred years ago, suggests we get in touch with Martians by reflecting the sunlight uh, to Martians and uh, actually several mirrors, uh, one where he lived in Paris and the others to outline the shape of the Big Dipper. And um, this unfortunately uh, was also not funded. The first funded project was to send pornography into space. Uh, this was in, um, in the 70s, not too long ago, about 50 years ago. Uh, and this was a, a, a plaque on the Pioneer 10 spacecraft. And you can see at the bottom of the plaque, uh, there is a picture of the solar system with the sun on the left and Mercury, Venus, and the spacecraft is leaving the Earth there. And then there are a couple of humans, and behind them is the spacecraft so that you get an idea what the size of the humans are. And then on the left, in the middle there, there's a little map that uh, gives directions to Earth in case ET wants to come and eat us. The humans were originally holding hands, but NASA thought that was not a good idea because ET might think it was one creature. So this was the first funded proje uh, project was to send pornography into space. Um, so one of the ideas in SETI is that Earthlings are sending off a lot of radio and television out into space. The early television shows left the Earth in the 40s and 50s, 70 years ago, and have gone past about 10,000 stars. And this is a plot of television power leaving the Earth as a function of time. And you can see we're getting brighter and brighter, although we're not growing quite as fast. But um, the Earth is brighter than the sun at television frequencies. I Love Lucy has uh, gone past these 10,000 stars. The nearby stars have, have seen The Simpsons. And uh, so be careful what you say if you're on the radio or TV. Radio waves also go out through the ionosphere, traveling at the speed of light. And uh, I think the early radio shows have gone out even farther than our television shows. Um, we've even sent messages on purpose. This is controversial. A lot of people think, including myself, don't think it's a good idea to deliberately send messages to ET because we don't know what's out there. Are they going to come and eat us? They're probably peaceful, advanced civilizations are, but we really don't know that for sure. So we don't think it's a good idea, or at least I don't think it's a good idea to transmit. But nevertheless, people have done that. And... We think a good way to send a message is pictures. They don't speak English, but they might understand pictures. And so this was a message sent in the 70s that from the Arecibo telescope, which got a big transmitter on it. It was sent for about two minutes in, uh, to a globular cluster that's 25,000 mile, sorry, 25,000 light years away. So it'll take 25,000 years for this message to get there. And if they want to respond, it'll take 25,000 years for them to send a message back. And uh, I, let's see, in the yellow part down at the bottom, there's a solar system with the sun on the left, the nine, the nine yellow squares. And then the planets, the third planet out from the sun is tipped toward the person in red there. There's DNA, that's the blue stuff. Um, so amino acids, that's the green stuff. Um, and uh, the, the telescope that it was sent from is uh, in purple there. So I think pictures might be a good way to communicate. So you can imagine uh, different kinds of signals that earthlings might be able to detect. One might be an artifact of their civilization, not really meant for us, just maybe meant for their internal communication. Maybe it's some kind of radio signal. Maybe it's a television or something like that. Maybe it's a radar signal, a navigational beacon that wasn't intended for us, but leaks off the planet, much the way that our television and radio and radar leak off our planet not intended for messages to ET. 
Another might be a, a deliberate signal. Maybe they seen oxygen in our atmosphere, or they've seen our, if they're nearby, they might have seen our early television. They might deliberately transmit a message to us. If they do that, they might make it easy to decode, anti-cryptographic with lots of pictures and language lessons. And, and probably, there, it's likely that a civilization will be more advanced than we are. So we could learn a lot. They could tell us how to get on the galactic internet, which allows us to talk to thousands of civilizations if there is a net, galactic internet out there. Um, and uh, we could learn all their science and music and poetry and literature and music. Um, so that'd be quite interesting. So the, I'm not the first person to do SETI experiments. Uh, these have been done for more than 100 years. Uh, Tesla and Marconi, the radio pioneers, 100 years ago looked for radio signals. And both of them thought that they had found signals. There were big headlines in the papers. Turned out they, they, um, they weren't listening to signals from ET. They were listening to distant lightning bolts that were thousands of miles away. And when, you get, when the lightning gets to a radio receiver, if it goes over thousands of miles bouncing around between the earth and the ionosphere, it, it, you get a whistling noise. You go, <whistles> they're called whistlers actually. And they th heard these signals. They didn't know that it was distant lightning and they thought it was ET. Frank Drake, the guy that did the, the Drake equation launched one of the modern searches uh, in, in 1960 and uh, looked at a couple of stars. The searches that we're doing now are much more powerful, but uh, we just look at a lot more frequencies and we look at a, a lot more stars and they're much more powerful and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So at Berkeley, we have a couple of dozen people. Uh, we have an organization called the Berkeley SETI Research Center and it's composed of students and uh, they are from the physics department and from the astronomy department and engineering department, computer science, and we all work together. We have um, some professional astronomers and scientists, and we have a lot of students that work in our group. And we receive funding from the National Science Foundation and NASA and the Breakthrough Foundation and some companies that donate the hardware that we use, computers and things that we need, chips. And then a lot of individuals around the world uh, donate money and that's very useful, keeps the students uh, going, uh, keeps their, allows the students to pay rent and buy food. We're very grateful to all the donors. Uh, we have different programs that have different kinds of telescopes looking at different wavelengths. We have optical telescopes we use, infrared. We don't know what method ET might use to send messages or how we could detect these uh, artifacts of their civilization. So we look at visible wavelengths, infrared wavelengths, when we look at a lot of different radio frequencies, radio wavelengths uh, with different telescopes. Um, this is a, our very first search that we did starting in the 70s and it was funded by NASA. So NASA requires to use acronyms. So Serendip is a search for extraterrestrial radio missions from nearby developed and intelligent populations. This logo was developed by Tucker Hyatt, who's a co-host of, of the speaker series. He's also the director of Wonderfest. This was the first telescope that we use to look for radio signals from ET. This is a big antenna we call it a radio telescope, but, but it's, in the, the, uh, it's a parabolic dish and the receivers are up at the focus there. And this is 85 feet across. It's in Northern California at Hat Creek Observatory. And while we were using this telescope, this is what happened to it. So that dish on the ground there used to be up on that pedestal. So we said, okay, that's the end of that. We went to this radio telescope, which is even bigger. This is 300 feet across in Green Bank, West Virginia. And while we're using this telescope, this is what happened to that. Uh, so that was the second dish to collapse while we were using the telescope. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this has sort of happened to us another time at Lick Observatory, which is a, a place where we're looking for uh, optical signals. They have optical telescopes at Lick Observatory. This is on Mount Hamilton right near San Jose. It's a two-hour drive from Berkeley. And just a few weeks ago there was a big fire that you can see almost got right up to the, the telescope that we use to look for laser signals from ET. Um, and then also recently the Arecibo telescope that we use for our SETI at home project um, was, um, and also we have the Serendip project at Arecibo. There um, one of the cables that suspends the, this, this um, receiver at the, above the dish, one of the cables broke and the dish uh, got smashed. So many of the telescopes that we use for SETI have gotten destroyed or smashed up. 
you might ask how that happened. According to the World Weekly News, the aliens did not want to be discovered, zapped by hostile space aliens. So now we're using new telescopes. Um, one of the big new projects we have is called the Breakthrough Listen Project. And um, they are funding several dishes, uh, searches at different telescopes. Here are three of the big telescopes that we use. At the top is the Lick Observatory. The telescope is called the Automatic Planet Finder, where we look for laser signals. And then the two at the bottom are radio telescopes. One's in the Northern Hemisphere, and one is in the Southern Hemisphere, the Green Bank Telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia. That's the new telescope that replaced the one that fell down. It's even better. And then the Parkes Telescope is in Australia, and we can look for stars in the Southern Hemisphere. But one of the problems in SETI is that we don't know what frequency ET might be broadcasting on. And so we want to listen to as many channels as we possibly can. And we don't want to scan, like tune the dial across, because that would take a long time. So it's, we want to have lots of, we want to listen to a lot of channels simultaneously. It's like having millions of radios on your desk, each one tuned to a different frequency. Um, and so this is a plot of the power coming off as a function of all the radio channels. So channel number 2,264,191 is on the left, channel number 2,264,959 is on the right. And you can see one of those radio channels has a lot of power in it. It's like tuning the radio dial and looking at the signal strength meter to see if it's, there's something strong there. Uh, but we don't tune one channel at a time. We look at all these, so we have like millions of, of radios each tuned to a different frequency all kind of simultaneously. So that speeds up the search. And there's one of those channels has a strong signal in it that you can see. I wish I could tell you that's ET, but it, unfortunately it's not. It's a satellite that was going over the dish. We have this problem that we're looking for radio signals from extraterrestrials, but we find them from terrestrials. It's called RFI, radio frequency interference, radio pollution. And the Earth is getting more and more polluted with radio and television and radar signals and cell phones and satellites going over the, over the radio telescopes. And we get all these false alarms and it's getting harder and harder. More and more of the bands are being occupied by radio pollution. Um, this is a different kind of signal that we want to look for. This is called a drifting signal where um, these are transmitters that are changing in frequency. You can see one's going down and a couple are going up going higher in frequency. And, and um, the, um, these can happen, these kind of drifting signals can happen because transmitters could be on planets that are spinning around like the Earth is spinning around every 24 hours or going around a, their star. And those accelerations introduce shifts, Doppler shifts in the frequency. So we want to look for these kind of patterns. And you can see these kind of patterns with your eye. Um, but we have about 100 million of these things to look at every second. So we need a lot of eyeballs to look at this data. Fortunately, computers can do it, but you need a lot of computing power to comb through the data to look for these. Another thing that we want to look for is pulsing signals. And here I've circled five pulses that are kind of evenly spaced. If I take away the circles, so these, these bip, 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 those are hard to find if I remove the circles, but a computer can do it. You can do it with your eye, but it takes a lot of time to, for your brain and your eye to do it. Um, but we need a lot of computing power to do this. And um, so what we've done, one of our projects, we ask volunteers around the world to help us. If you have a computer at home or at the office or a cell phone, you can analyze the data from the Arecibo Observatory. This is called the SETI at Home Project. Some of you might participate in it. You might know about it. We take the data from Arecibo. We store it up. Uh, we store it on a big um, facility um, in Berkeley. Uh, and um, we break the data up into little pieces so everybody gets a different part of the sky to work on. And then we send it out to volunteers around the world who are running the SETI at Home screensaver. And if you want to want to help us, you can download this SETI at Home screensaver and it runs on, uh, on uh, Windows or Mac or a bunch of different kinds of computers or Android cell phones. And uh, when you install, it's this free program and it, uh, and when you go out for a cup of coffee, instead of just putting pretty pictures up, on your uh, computer, it actually goes through this data that you've been assigned, that little part of the sky that you've been assigned, and look for strong signals, and it looks for a lot of different kinds of signals. And it takes a few days maybe to analyze that piece of data that you've been assigned. And then if it finds something interesting, it sends the results over the net back to our computers at Berkeley. And your name is attached to that data. So if you find ET, you might get the Nobel Prize. Uh, this is a little uh, graphic of the data that's going out from Berkeley. The yellow dots 
are uh, the work units, the little pieces of the sky going out to the volunteers. The blue dots are that when they finished analyzing the data, they send the information back. And together, these volunteers have formed one of the biggest supercomputers. There are 8 million people who signed up for SETI at home, and it's formed one of the biggest computers on the planet. And it's made the search much more powerful than anything that we could have done without the help from the volunteers around the world. Well, we haven't found ET yet, uh, but um, I'm a little uncomfortable justifying SETI by spin-offs. It's like NASA saying, give us more money because we invented Velcro and Tang. Uh, but we haven't found ET. We have found a bunch of other stuff, and I, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Um, so one of the things that I'm happy about is that we developed this curriculum uh, with, together with the Lawrence Hall of Science to get kids engaged in SETI and learning about the, this question, are we alone? A lot of kids are interested in this question, are we alone? And it's a good hook because when you address this question, are we alone, you can, uh, kids can learn about astronomy, about physics, they can learn how life got started, that involves chemistry and evolution uh, and biology. Um, they can learn a little bit about computers. They can, uh, there's all kinds of different areas of science that this question, are we alone, touches on. So it's a good hook for getting kids interested in science. Another thing we did that a lot of people are using is uh, when we developed the SETI at home code, we also made it possible to put, to use your computer to do lots of other scientific supercomputing projects uh, and use your computer at home to participate in hundreds of projects. It's open source code to do volunteer computing or distributed computing. And now there are a lot of projects that you can use your home computer to do, um, including uh, drug research, cancer drugs, HIV drugs, malaria drugs. And now there's a new one looking for COVID-19 therapeutics. Uh, and that one is called Rosetta at Home. And it's looking for new proteins that will help uh, in the uh, therapeutics for COVID-19. And it, that project just got a big prize, uh, the breakthrough prize, uh, $3 million prize, because they found some new interesting uh, therapeutics for COVID-19. Uh, anyway, you can also use your home computer for a bunch of different astronomy projects. Uh, there you can look for gravity waves and pulsars and planets, a bunch of biology projects. And you can allocate how you want your computer to be used. Uh, you can do global warming research. You can say, I want 30% of my computer cycles to go for uh, climate change research, global warming research. Um, you can look for gravity waves. You can say, I want 20% of my, my spare computing cycles to look for COVID-19 projects. That's the Rosetta. And you can pick your favorite projects. We've also been developing citizen science projects where you not just use your computer or your cell phone to help in scientific uh, supercomputing projects, but you can also do projects which require your brain. Our, our first project was uh, a project called Stardust at home. There was a, a, a project we sent out um, a, a spacecraft that we sent out to collect a comet and uh, interplanetary dust. And we brought that dust back to our lab in this aerogel foam, and we made millions and millions of photographs. And the volunteers can help us find little microscopic dust particles. And you take a little training course, and you run the Stardust at home uh, virtual microscope, and you can find the particles. If you find one of these particles, especially if you find one of the interstellar particles or interplanetary particles, we can, it helps us learn about how the planets formed in our solar system. Then you get your name on a nature paper. And now there are a lot of these citizen science projects. You might have heard of some of them. Another kind of spin-off from our SETI project is that we developed some very powerful instruments, uh, you know, because we need to look at a lot of different signal types and a lot of different frequencies and analyze data with a kind of supercomputers, but we built these specialized instruments uh, at the telescope. And we were able to adapt them to look for lots of other things. And a lot of people have been using these instruments that, we, that were derived from our SETI instrumentation. Um, and we helped them develop the instruments that made the first images of a, of a black hole. You might've seen that in the, in the news um, about a year ago. Um, they've been uh, used to find, uh, make a discovery of these things called fast radio bursts, uh, very, on, very extremely powerful bursts that um, they travel for a billion years before they get to us and still they're the most powerful thing in the sky. Uh, most pulsars that have been discovered are from these uh, instruments that were originally developed for SETI. 
Uh, they've discovered a planet made out of solid diamond. A lot of interesting astronomy discoveries have come from SETI-based instruments. They're used outside of astronomy too, a little bit in mostly in physics, but some in medicine. Uh, this was a project that we did to read out um, some neurons that were firing in, in, uh, in your brain. And the idea is to control uh, a, a prosthetic arm. So when you, instead of having a bunch of wires controlling the prosthetic arm, uh, it's, a, it's a radio link from neurons in your brain and you just think, I want my arm to move. And um, that we haven't done yet. So far, we just got the data out of the brain. We haven't tied it to a prosthetic arm. Uh, one of our big spin-off is that hundreds of students have worked for us uh, and learned how to do all kinds of stuff. And there, a lot of the students are doing well. Um, at the bottom left there, Pierre Droz, he started the, one of the early self-driving car companies. And uh, now he's working at Google, um, as you can imagine. Um, and he developed those little LiDAR machines that kind of figure out where everything is around the car. Uh, Shelly Wright, I'll talk a little bit about what she's doing uh, this Pano SETI project. And then Aaron Parsons on the bottom right, he is a professor at Berkeley, learning how the very first stars and galaxies formed, building a big telescope in South Africa to study the early universe. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about some of the new things that we're working on. Uh, so there's a new telescope in China called FAST, and it's uh, even bigger than Arecibo. Arecibo is the 300 meters across. It holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes, the one in Puerto Rico. This one is 500 meters across, and it's just getting going, and we're going to do a big three-year survey, a SETI sky survey with this telescope. And uh, we're working together with the Chinese astronomers on this, and while we're surveying the sky, doing a big raster scan of the sky, there are going to be several experiments, not just SETI experiments, but we're going to look for pulsars, and we're going to map the galaxy and map other galaxies, the hydrogen and other galaxies. We're going to be searching for new fast radio bursts and, um, and um, doing, I think, five different experiments simultaneously. So we'll all use the telescope and survey the sky together. Uh, this thing is an artist conception. This thing doesn't exist yet. It's called SKA, Square Kilometer Ray. It's being built in Australia and in South Africa. And, and that, will, that telescope will consist of thousands of dishes all working together, maybe 4,000 dishes all working together to make a huge telescope. And right now, there are prototypes of this thing in South Africa and in Australia. And we're using the one in South Africa now or we're getting ready to use the, the prototype. It's not as big as this thing. It's got 64 dishes, and we're going to be doing a, a, a sky survey um, on that telescope. So one of the new things that I'm working on is called uh, Pano SETI, and um, there are a bunch of people working on it. This is a project at UC San Diego, and also at Harvard, and at Berkeley, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this. So this is an idea of a telescope that can look everywhere at once. So one of the problems that we have with almost every telescope on the planet, it just looks at a little tiny part of the sky at a time. And uh, so we look at a star for a few minutes and then we move to a different part of the sky, but the telescope only looks at a millionth of the sky at a time. So if you're looking in this direction uh, for a, maybe a laser flash or something like that, but he tees off in this direction and they're flashing you, you're not gonna see him because you're pointed in the wrong place. So if ET only flashes us once a week or months, once a month or something like that, if it's a sporadic, uh, what we call low duration signal, it'd be very hard to find him. So this is a telescope that looks kind of every place at the same time. It's made of uh, about a hundred telescopes there poking out of that dome. And um, the, this is looking for laser signals. Um, and in the beginning um, of the early kind of when lasers were just getting started in the 60s, lasers were not very powerful. They couldn't even reach the nearest star. They'd be very difficult to communicate with lasers. But the new lasers are incredibly powerful, a, a petawatt. And we could communicate with, with uh, our new lasers across the galaxy that they're reaching 100 billion stars. If they had similar technology, they could could signal us and we could communicate. Um, we, we've been looking for laser signals for a while, although we haven't looked, we haven't built this thing with a hundred telescopes all looking all over the place. 
But at Lick Observatory, we had the, the, uh, one of the early searches for, for laser signals. You can see the original team there with uh, Frank Drake and Shelley Wright, who was a student in my group at the time. And um, we built these simple detectors looking for visible lasers. And then we, uh, more recently, we did a search for, for infrared lasers at Lick Observatory. Um, but um, the problem, as I mentioned, is that we just look at one little place at a time. We've looked at a lot of places, but if you kind of look at a time lapse, you can see that the beam is kind of jumping around. It move, looks at a star for a few minutes and then moves around. So we want to make this all sky, all the time search. And we need inexpensive detectors to do this um, because we need a lot of them to, to kind of tile the sky. And it used to cost about $1,000 per pixel now, but now it's about $5 a pixel for one of these things. And that's because um, these new detectors are used in, in uh, medicine research to detect cancer. They're called PET machines, positron emission tomography machines. And a lot of hospitals have these things and they made them very cheap. They just came out on the market recently. And so now um, we can have thousands of these detectors. In fact, we can have about 100,000 detectors in one of these domes. And the other thing that makes it cheap now is that we can use inexpensive lenses. They're called Fresnel lenses. These are plastic lenses. This is Shelly Wright standing in front of them. She's directing the project. And so we combine these detectors with our Fresnel lenses. And we don't have hundreds of telescopes now. We just have two telescopes at Lick Observatory. We're just learning how to do this, but it's, it's working pretty well. Uh, here's the dome uh, with the two telescopes poking out. Uh, we call it, we're observing in pajama mode. We're observing uh, remotely uh, now, um, uh, and that works pretty well. We, got our, uh, we can log into our computers and examine the data, and we got the thing working pretty well, and we're ready to scale it up and start building 100 telescopes in a dome. So um, a little bit about kind of what, what I think is going to happen in our future is that I think I'm optimistic in the long run. I, I think it would be very lucky to detect extraterrestrials if they're out there now, because we're just learning how to do this. We're getting in the game. And even though I'm really proud of what we're doing, we're just covering little bits of the spectrum. We can't cover, look at the whole, different, all the different radio bands and optical and infrared. We can't do a big thorough search of the whole sky. Um, but uh, the things are getting better exponentially. And this is a plot of radio telescope sensitivity uh, improving. This is um, a plot of the number of channels in our system. Now we used to look, listen to 100 channels in the 70s. Now we're listening to um, 5 billion channels. Uh, and we're, we're the one in China now is almost 100 billion channels. So that's um, doubling every 20 months. The capabilities are doubling because of the technology um, coming out of Silicon Valley, mostly we take advantage of that. This is computing power as a function of time. Right now, computers are as smart as a, a lizard or as a, gup, or a guppy maybe, but um, if this trend keeps going, computers will be as smart as humans in 20 or 30 years. So that will be very good for SETI. We can do very powerful searches. May not be good for our civilization though, depending on how we use those computers. Oh, let me stop this before I, I want to tell you a little bit about something that is maybe a hundred years away. This is a, a project called Starshot. And uh, this is an uh, artist's conception of what it might look like. The idea is to, that we could maybe send a spacecraft to the nearest star or some of the nearest stars. Um, now, if you use conventional rocket technology, this, it would take about a hundred thousand years to get to a star. Um, rockets right now go 25,000 miles an hour. And uh, so they're way too slow um, to do it in kind of human lifetimes. But this thing might get us to the nearest star in 20 years. And the way it works is you build a big laser on the ground, actually composed of lots of lasers. And, uh, and then you shine that laser against a spacecraft and it has to be a very lightweight spacecraft. This whole thing weighs about an ounce. It's four meters by four meters. It's just a big sail. It's a very, very thin sail. It's only a few atoms thick. And then you shine the lasers on this sail for a couple of minutes. And it's a 50 gigawatt laser. So the sail accelerates really fast for a couple minutes. And it gets up to about 20% the speed of light if the thing only weighs about a gram. And after about two minutes, the beam is bigger than the sail and you turn it off, but then it coasts at 20% the speed of light. It'll get to the nearest star 
in 20 years, maybe take a picture and send us back a picture of the, of the planets going around Alpha Centauri. That's called Breakthrough Starshot. And people are just beginning to think about how we might do that. But it's a long way off, but might could happen in our lifetimes. Um, this might happen in our lifetimes, but I think it's maybe a few generations down the road where you could use the sun as a gravitational lens. And the idea is to make a telescope the size of the sun. The problem is that the sun bends the light rays, it's got gravity, and it, it works like a lens, but the focus is way out beyond Pluto, so you got to put your camera way out there. But if you could do that, you get 10 meter resolution on an extrasolar planet. You can almost, you know, see cars driving around if they have cars on extrasolar planets. A couple of my favorite quotes. Um, Phil Morrison said, SETI is the archaeology of the future. What he meant by that was that if we ever do get in touch with another civilization, it's going to be very hard to find them if they're primitive, if they're single-celled creatures or trees or bacteria. But um, if, we, if they have technology, we might find them. But it's going to be hard to find them if they just developed radio or television. It's more likely that we'll find them um, uh, a billion years ahead of us or a few billion years ahead of us. And then we could learn a lot. We could learn kind of what might be in our future. Um, and then uh, Carl Sagan said that SETI is profound either way. And what he meant by that is that if we find them and we get on the galactic internet, uh, we'll learn that we're not alone. We could learn a lot about, our, about other civilizations. Uh, it'll be really exciting, really interesting. It's also profound the other way. If we do a big thorough search and we find out that we are alone, then we'll know that life is incredibly precious and we better take really good care of all the life on this planet. Okay, if you've been asleep, this is kind of the only slide you have to remember. Uh, no ET so far, we're still working on it. But this is not my last slide. I've got um, a couple more slides I wanna show you. Um, so the volunteers in SETI at Home and the people that help us um, write our software, it's a big open source project. They, they, uh, they send money that keeps the students going. We're very grateful to all of the donors. Um, we, uh, they send in literature, they compose music. There's a lot of help that they give us. They also send in haikus and thousands of people have sent haikus about SETI. Um, but don't worry, I'm not gonna read you a thousand haikus. I just wanna read you a couple of them. Uh, Paula Cook at Duke University, searching for life, answers are revealed about ourselves. And this is the last slide, Dan Seidner, another haiku. One million earthlings bounded by optimism leave their PCs on. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate your listening. And if you are a part of this uh, participating where we're gonna have a, a live Zoom with question and answers, please stick around. I would enjoy uh, listening to your questions and comments and hopefully address some of your questions. So stick around. Thanks very much. I wonder if cows love, I wonder if space and the stars above Hold secrets and back doors, I wonder if the song's been written before and Kids always ask you, why's the earth round and why's the sky blue? And sometimes we spit back, curiosity killed the cat well, As we grow older, everything starts to look so familiar I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Naming something doesn't mean that we get it So I'll live each day with 